welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 123rd episode, our returning guest is Carlos Dangler. You first heard Carlos Dangler on episodes 87 and 88 of the podcast. Carlos Dangler is a New York City actor, writer, and musician. He has written for N Plus One and Seven Stories Press, and is working with Foundry Literary and Media on writing his first memoir. In 2016, Carlos wrote and performed his first one-person show for the New York City International Fringe Festival called Homo Sapiens Interruptus. Later in the year, he understudied for Josh Radner at Lincoln Center Theater in a production of the Richard Greenberg play, The Babylon Line. Also in 2016, Carlos appeared as a guest musician with the Late Night with Seth Meyers Band. Carlos spent the better part of the aughts from 1997 to 2010 playing bass and keyboards with the band Interpol, which he co-founded with other band members at NYU. Recently, in 2015, he received an MFA from NYU Grad Acting in addition to a BA in Philosophy, also from NYU, back in 1999. Carlos is on Twitter at DanglerCarlos and on Instagram at Carlos Andres Dangler. Carlos is also an avid hiker and backpacker and is currently raising money for the Fresh Air Fund, a nonprofit organization that helps inner city kids experience the outdoors. To donate to his campaign, visit his website at www.carlosdangler.com and click the donate button. This is a very special episode of The Rob Burgess Show. At the end, Carlos will read his essay, Downtown and Gentrification, Dystopia or Enlightened Future, published by Seven Stories Press Blog. And just before that, I'm including a snippet of a June 6th, 2015 recording of the podcast Weird Adults at the Comedy Attic in Bloomington, Indiana, which I covered as a journalist during the Limestone Comedy Festival. And now, on to the show. Hello. Hey, Carlos. Hey, Rob. Hey. <laughs> are we not alone? <laughs> we are certainly not alone. <laughs> you know, this is what happens when you try to get a landline in 2018. Well, I have to say, you sound crystal clear, so I think we're <laughs> it was all worth it. <laughs> I think you're right. For sure. Yeah, just the, the beauty of... Uh, of listening to people on the landline. Oh, absolutely, for sure. Um, well, thanks for you know traveling to a, a separate location on a Friday night to, to talk with me. I, I appreciate the effort, and I appreciate you coming back. Hey, I wouldn't have done this just for the podcast. I made sure that I had some errands to run downtown. Well, thanks for uh, throwing some... Uh, <laughs> abusing me of that notion. Like item number four. Oh, all right, good. Well, well, my ego is properly deflated now, so... <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, well, that's, that's good that you got a few things done, but, uh, how did the, uh, audition go the other day? The audi- oh, that was, um, that was Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It went really well. Good. I just, you know, for me, the attitude is, um, you know, I can't control what, what comes out of the process, but, mm-hmm. you know, I can't control the result. And if I try to, I'll go crazy. Mm-hmm. The only thing I care, the only thing I can control and the thing that i really just care about is making sure that i just deliver what i um what i worked on Mm -hmm. and and didn't let you know anything kind of fluster me or get in my way and that's what happened um and at this point you know i i I have no reason not i have no reason to get flustered by anything i I used to uh in the beginning with auditions but uh, i feel like basically every audition i've been on this year i felt really really good um, about the work that I did, irrespective of whether I got the gig or not. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. I mean, that's all you can control, but, um, yeah. So how is your memoir writing going right now? I've got the, uh, proposal, um, in my editor's hands and, um, just waiting to see what he brings back. Um, we collaborated together when I wrote a piece for, um, N plus one and, um, it was a really great collaboration. I, w- I really felt, you know, I was learning a lot from him, and he was able to really find a way to to uh, clarify what I was uh, kind of putting down on paper, which is an editor's job, really. Um, but he just, we just had a, a rapport that was that was really great. So I'm looking forward to um, seeing what he comes up with. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and um, that's a. It was long to get the proposal um, into his hands, 
Um, it, it took, I don't know, I, I, it's not even more than 30 pages, although I think, I think I, if the, we, we do have to trim it down, but I, I think I submitted something like, you know, around, I don't know, 15,000 words or something. Mm. And it's got to go down to like 10 or mm. something. Um, but, um, you know, 15,000 words, you know, some people can can do that in a week. It took me like two years. <laughs> but uh, it's the first time I'm doing that. Plus, it's writing about, you know, sensitive material, very personal mm-hmm. um, stuff. And um, also just discovering what my, my voice is, my writer's voice is, which, you know, if it only took two years, that's not so bad. No, not at all. And, you know, you got to think about other people, too. You're not just writing about, I mean, you're writing about yourself, obviously, because it's a memoir, but you're using your real life and your real life experiences, and there's other people to consider, I'm sure. It's a lot. It's a lot, you know. Um, I just finished reading a book called The Art of Memoir mm. by Mary Carr, and uh Boy, I recommend that book for anybody, even if you're uh, any writer, not mm-hmm. if you're a memoir writer. But for the memoir writer, it is just a gold mine of wisdom. Um, and, uh, you know, I had a really kind of powerful experience reading her memoir, uh, her book on her memoir recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, pardon me. The book is about memoir writing. She also has written a, a memoir. I have not read that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, uh, it was just, it's kind of nerve wracking because of how she made me kind of look back on the thrust of some of the things that I was writing about and question it and question the integrity of it and question the motives behind it. Um, I think when you're writing a memoir, you are given to score settling and uh, raking things up. Um, It's so natural to do that, to just like look back on your life and co- want to correct the record. But that's really not what the uh, process is about. Mm. And she zeroes in on that, you know, constantly shining a flashlight on what you're doing. Like, oh, are you trying to settle a score there? Are you trying to you know, do something uh, manipulative? Are you trying to manipulate the reader? And... Many, many times as I was reading the book, I was like, oh, that is kind of what I'm doing, trying to do in that one part. So, you know, and I, have, I haven't even really started writing the memoir in, um, in earnest. You know, this is just the proposal to submit for publishing mm-hmm. um, to, to hopefully get on board. Um, so I, uh, I anticipate a, a very long kind of soul-searching road ahead. Mm. Now, do you have any diaries or journals to draw from from your younger days? You know, I don't know whether I'm fortunate or unfortunate, but I have kept journals ever since I was 18. Wow. Do you ever go back and look at them? Just Yes, I do. do. (laughs) It might be unfortunate. The things that I read uh, were terrifying. Sure. It's like, who is this person? (laughs) And listen, I mean, this is something that I'm going to go into... um, um, into the memoir, but I mean, I'm sure it will shock no one that someone who became a successful uh, rock musician uh, had issues with his brain. Um, You're kidding. <laughs> and I would drive someone with issues with their brain to, to try to be in a rock band. Sure. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, reading some of these entries from when I was 19, from when I was 21, Oh, good God. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, just and also just the level of, of um, pain that I was in. Mm. So some of that stuff was kind of difficult to read through. But, you know, I have about like a box and a half, mm. of, like those wide-ruled composition notebooks. Mm. You know, I sometimes would take, you know, a trip to Barnes & Noble and get one of those nice leather-bound ones. But for the most part, it was the composition books. And, um, and uh I have I have a I have a big stack of them, so I I definitely plan on on reading through them, mm-hmm. you know, in in preparation for the memoir. But I, you know, I'm nothing. I'm not going to be. I, I think what those things are going, what, what reading all that stuff is going to do is, it's just going to trigger other memories. Mm-hmm. Trigger like, oh, that was that time when that was happening. You know, things that I haven't thought of mm-hmm. in ages. 
frankly, I've read I've I've read some entries and just been like, who is Tommy? I don't <laughs> remember who the fuck is Tommy. <laughs> Right, and it's like this seemed very important to you at the time. Like you were always going to know who Tommy was, right? <laughs> there was one entry. I mean, this was one of the ones where I was like, okay, so you know, thank God I I joined a band and it became successful and was <laughs> able to kind of just unleash all the the rage that was in me. But because mm. I don't want to even contemplate what avenues I may have sought out had I not had that release valve, Mm -hmm. you know, only being a rock star can, can give one. Um, but there was one entry where I think I devoted three pages or more. Well, let's just say three pages to how my hairdresser had ruined my hair. (laughs) I don't, I don't mean to laugh. I'm sorry. I shouldn't laugh. (laughs) I laughed at (laughs) you. And, I, and this was when I was like Mr. Metrosexual, which is, uh-huh. which is what I became. This was before I moved to New York. Hmm. This was just when I was, this was like 1998, hmm. 97, I want to say. Um, this was when grunge was alive and kicking. And mm-hmm. I had kind of like a bob cut and mm. a goatee. So I, I wasn't exactly flaunting a kind of chic, you know, uh, precise metrosexual vibe, which is you know, what most of the pictures that you'll find up on the internet of me are. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, I, uh, uh, but I would nonetheless was as fastidious back then as, uh, as I turned out to be later on. Mm-hmm. Um, but this was, you know, reading that entry, I was just like, um, you know, the level of fixation on it was to me indicative of really some dysregulation in terms of mood in terms of uh, depra- issues like depression and just, you know, kind of a, a mild divorcing from, you know, kind of reality. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that's something, that's a big takeaway from, from a lot of those early journal entries. And uh, I'm glad you're bringing this up because those are painful things to uh, to go back to. We all have, you know, things that we are embarrassed about and that we don't, would prefer. Mm-hmm. Uh, never to have to revisit again. And most of us don't. Most of us run away from all that right. for the rest of our lives. Right. But there is some, so much value, not only in just going back, but if you are in a position to um, reveal to, to, to the public that sort of act of kind of, you know, uh, showing the world, mm-hmm. being naked in, in front of the world, um, is, um, I think is really valuable and um, I want to, you know, work on that and, and be able to build up the courage to, to, to be as honest and as ruthlessly honest as I can. Not ruthless in a negative sense, but just, you know, unwaveringly honest, no matter, you know, what uh, kind of comes up. And judging from what I read in those entries, there's a lot there mm-hmm. <laughs> to, to give me, sure, you know. Yeah, but I mean, I think in a lot of writing that of that variety, I think the more specific you are, the more uh, applicable that it becomes to other people. Like even if you don't think anyone else could relate to this, if you're being super specific, it actually does somehow become more relatable. Interesting how that works, right? Mm-hmm. You you think that it would go the opposite way? Like the more vague and general I am, mm-hmm. the better. Mm-hmm the more people will relate. And actually it's quite the opposite. As soon as that happens, you lose everyone. And everyone says, there's something deep within where people just, they register, they know their subconscious, their heart registers and says, you know, Oh, this is, this isn't doing anything. This isn't, you know, Mm -hmm. and you, you, you I mean, look, I, I, I loved Friday night lights. Uh, the, 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 the television show. Do, do I like football at all? Mm-mm. Absolutely not. I'm not a football person at all. No disrespect to any football junkies out there. Like, <laughs> that's per- personal. I'm more of a baseball guy. Right. But um, but I I was entranced by that show mm-hmm. because that show was honest. That show had heart. That show that show had reality. That show had per- incredible. Um, performances where the actors laid out their hearts on their sleeves Mm -hmm. and the writing was fantastic. It was real. And so I didn't care that it was about football after the first five minutes. Mm -hmm. I cared about these people. Right. 
And that is it's true. It's because it was so specific. It was so inside the world of these people. And, um, you know, I can only hope to achieve, uh, you know, a, um, uh, some, some kind of similar approach to, to my memoir. Mm-hmm. Just uh, laying bare those kinds of vulnerabilities. Definitely. Well, I mean, is this um, gentrification piece part of your memoir, or was this a separate thing? So, it's, it's totally separate. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I'm noticing is that when I do these these pieces, and uh, you may have noticed this from comparing it to the N plus one piece, um, is that, I don't know, I kind of, I, 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 I like to talk about the past, and when I bring it up, the details really kind of come alive. So I do use like memoiristic um, components in this kind of writing. I think the gentrification piece, in spe- specifically, kind of was functioning more as an op-ed piece. Like the the thrust of it was very op-eddy. Um, I noticed towards the end of it, that I was like, oh, this is really becoming an op-ed piece. I, I don't know how clear I was with myself or with the editor. That's exactly kind of what I was going to, but for better or for worse, that's how it turned out. Um, I think that's probably what the mission of the piece was to begin with, which is to talk, make a point. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I made that point, and um, and then I just decided, well, okay, let me also throw in um, memoir um, bits into there. So, you know, yeah, there might be, you know, scenes like that, like that are in that gentrification piece that'll be fleshed out you know, over several pages um, when I read the memoir. But specifically for this piece, I think they were there more in service for the point Mm -hmm. that I was making. Right. And that, you know, point is, at least in part, I think gentrification is often seen as a dirty word, but it's not all bad, and it does have things that are good about it. And that's not, you know, it's not a very popular opinion, or at least one we hear in the, you know, mainstream a lot. Yeah, I I, I agree with that. And um, it was difficult for me to write that, um, to make that point. Um I, uh, for a long time, I was, and I, I think I say this in the piece that, you know, I was very, you know, taking the more popular standpoint of like, you know, gentrification is bad and to hell with all these high rises and all these, um, artisanal frat houses or whatever they are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm just calling them frat houses because the people who go in there look like, frat <laughs> um, but you know, but this is how I feel. And, um, one kind of—I I don't want to say a, a regret that I have, but a um, a little a, a, a little bit of like the feedback that I got from from the piece from some people, and they, it pretty much all centered on the omission in the piece, or at least the, the ostensible omission that of the if the the negative effects of gentrification of how it has pushed people. Way. One person in particular who was a um, a trans person who contacted me said that uh, they didn't know, um, you know, how they were going to survive when uh, in their new neighborhood that they were pushed out of because they couldn't afford the, the recently gentrified neighborhood and that they're being pushed into a neighborhood that is not as tolerant. Hmm. So that kind of gave me some pause, you know, and and I and so I do I I was kind of. Um, eager to have this uh, conversation just to um, walk back not, well, not I don't want to say walk back because I, I don't want to walk back comments because I kind of think it's lame when people walk back comments but just to, to add the caveat that I wish I could have written more I wish I could have written mm-hmm. I wish I could have uh, had time to, to to perhaps include that in fact early uh, drafts did have some uh, aside about the negative effects of gentrification mm-hmm um, those are real effects. I mean, those, those are people's lives that are that are being really, you know, in some ways, kind of, you know, genocidally kind of affected. You know, mm-hmm. classes of people without options who can't partake for, with whatever cultural revolutions are happening. Mm-hmm. They didn't get a college education because they are um, not as uh, high functioning as other people because they are, you know, just not culturally disposed to, to bear witness to whatever, you know, more money, what the more moneyed class thinks is cool. These people don't have those options. 
mm-hmm. um, and they have to move out. And that's a real, you know, that's a real um, impact. And, um, you know, especially queer people and trans people that maybe, or and also persons of color who, who can't uh, live in that neighborhood anymore because it's been um, priced out. They have to go to other places that maybe might not be as tolerant as mm-hmm. the person that contact me. So that's also another real effect. I just wanted to throw that out there because I wanted it really made me think about the impact of that and how I didn't really write about that mm-hmm. piece. And I just I think for me the real thrust of it had to be um, talking about more of like a from an artist standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just what the artist you know as if as if all we're talking about is just artistically what does it mean. Mm-hmm. Um, so I definitely ignored, and maybe this is a problem with the piece, the sort of economic, you know, there's just a stricter, more economic sphere mm-hmm. um, of gentrification, because I wanted to make just more about the aesthetic point. Mm-hmm. That being said, though, I, I definitely want to just kind of, uh, not double down, but reiterate that um, I, I, I do still believe that, um, you know, there are... We do live in a very, very uh, polarized time, obviously, mm-hmm. and we and we, and there are certain very, very real, concrete evils that are happening in the current administration politically. The rise of populism globally is a is a huge, what I would consider to be a huge problem, um, and that does not bode well for liberal uh, nations and democratic nations. <clears throat> that being said, we do have a zeitgeist that I think is coming and some people will say that's that's politically correct and i don't like that well you know i happen to be a fan of political correctness actually i'm kind of a proud proudly political i call political correctness just plain old good old-fashioned courtesy Mm -hmm. um but um we live in a time when now we have prescriptions or proscriptions on, on on certain um on on certain labels certain speech certain words ideas we are becoming educated about um all sorts of different cultures and ways of understanding our own privilege our own power the the way our the color of our skin may give us privilege may give us power we didn't really know those i mean anyone who's in our age group or at least in my age group um, (laughs) I, I encourage to just kind of reflect what it was like when we were in high school mm. and to think that we had access to some of the modalities that that just about any kid who owns an iPhone or an iPad has access to, just the kind of information, the kind of um, the kind of like um, schemas that are available to understand very complex social situations <clears throat> involving other people's cultures or other people's values or other people's religions. We didn't have that. Mm-hmm. Even in the 90s. I mean, go back to some of the... the look up some stand-up routines from the 90s. It is sometimes very difficult. Even even episodes of Seinfeld are now becoming mm. to me. I mean, the, think about the Manhands episode. Mm. That was <clears throat> that, there was a time when that that scene was so funny. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I'd be able to look at that scene today, knowing what I know, and look at that and laugh along with it, because there'd be part of me that would be saying, "Well, now we're shaming like we're in a highly gendered fashion." Mm-hmm. Um, we're just we're so aware now. Of course, there's so much work that has to be done, and none of this is institutionalized, and it's we do have a whole other part of the population that calls all this stuff horseshit, or at least they don't even understand any of it, and they just react with fear and anger towards it. Mm-hmm. So yes, the battle rages. My the, my piece was 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 written because I just wanted to I wanted to celebrate that that victory. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now that victory <clears throat> pardon me I'm I'm very dehydrated so <laughs> my throat's all m- messed up right now <clears throat> that victory also cannot be so 
can, it cannot be divorced from, you know, the, the economic aspect of gentrification, all that money that's coming in. Mm -hmm. And so for instance, I'm, to I, I, I was at Pride this, this year and I was torn because there were so many, and we all know this, there's so many floats, so many commercial floats. There's like the, the T-Mobile float and the, mm -hmm. the buy float. And it's just like, what? Like, why am I, how am I supposed to cheer this on? It's just a walking advertisement, right? Mm -hmm. Now, on the one hand, that is just a kind of, it's really an awful, crass commercial kind of, um, in a way, a lapse of what was probably at one time something that was very renegade and very um, potent in its kind of... Um, in, in it's sort of uh, fringe. It was a fringe kind of movement. Pride was like a way to celebrate something that was on the fringes. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of you know seeing kind of like commercials kind of is a letdown from that perspective. But if you look at it actually from the standpoint of like oh wait, if if now it is lucrative for corporations who only care about money, they don't care about the social issues. They'll they'll support Nazism if that becomes. The majority opinion. So like, mm -hmm. I, I'm very, very cynical when it comes to the morals of of, um, of corporations. I think at the at the end of the day, they're concerned about who's, you know, whether they're making their bottom line or not. And so then they'll just jump on what makes sure that that happens. And if it's a social movement that is involved with shaming people who don't, you know, who, do, who want to like destroy certain parts of the public, they'll go right ahead and shame those people. And just get on that bandwagon just to make sure that they don't lose their bottom line. It's a very cynical approach to corp corporations, but that's that's my that's my belief. Um, so I don't think that T-Mobile is necessary. You know, I'm not I'm not convinced really at this time that they're really all that motivated to get behind LGBT rights, um, and that that's why that float was in the Pride Parade. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I, I firmly believe that you know they were trying to make a buck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now. That is a good thing, though, mm -hmm. because if they're trying to make a buck off this, that means this is mainstream, and isn't that the goal? Mm -hmm. You know, some people might dip, might beg to differ, but I, I feel like it's a good sign if money has come in to what was once a fringe thing, because now it's normalized, and we don't have to look at it as a kind of like... Let's go to the freak show. Let's go to West Village where all the gay people are. Like, it's not a freak show anymore. It's actually just real life. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's a great point. It's kind of like corporate, uh, you know, gentrification. So, um, what you're talking about. But um, the uh, the piece that you wrote uh, actually made me think of a, a podcast that I saw the taping of in 2015. It was uh, Weird Adults, and the guest was Janine Garofalo. Um, and she had a really great quote about this, and I think it relates to what you're talking about. So, I was, I was going to read it to you and, and get your reaction real quick here. Um, Wait, some weird, sorry? Uh, sorry the, the name of the podcast is Weird Adults, and the host is Esther Povitz but they call her a little Esther. She's a comedian. Anyway, she interviewed. Yeah. She Did you Ruffalo was a guest. Yes. This on the podcast. Right? Yes. And it was, well, it was in 2015, but it made your piece made me think of it. New York in the late seventies. Mm -hmm. You could live on the Lower East Side, uh, for very cheap. And that's why it bums me out when people talk about gentrification. Has anybody been on Avenue A in 1973? I have. Believe me, it's much nicer now. Yes. There's thin crust pizza and a Starbucks. <laughs> 1973 on Avenue A, where my grand, where my dad's aunt lived. Have you ever seen Dog Day Afternoon or Taxi Driver? <laughs> that that's real. That's real. That was New York in the 70s and and 80s and mid 80s. Uh, you had to run home. You didn't go anywhere near the parks. So there, it's not all bad gentrification. And by the way, gentrification. The only people who have the right to complain are the Native American First Nation people. <laughs> They're the only people that have a bone to pick with us about gentrification. Other than that, uh, that has been the nature of life, gentrification. Everybody has pushed somebody else out uh, all the time. And, and, you know, people used to get mugged and sexually assaulted on the Lower East Side every single day during the halcyon days of Richard Hell and the Voidoids and CBGBs. Yes, punk rock, I get it. Uh, you also, would you like to be sexually assaulted outside of CBGBs? Because you could do that. In 1977, it's quite easy. It happened all the time. So, yes, now there's a John Vivardos there. <laughs> but you can walk safely at 4 a.m. And I think there is, you have to take the good with the bad. Now, there's been a whole other real estate issue with 
the prices and the gap between the haves and have nots that's a whole nother night of talk if anyone's <laughs> interested but uh <laughs> but but gentrification is not entirely awful, right? For for especially for females, um, there is a safety issue involved in that. So, what do you think of that? Well, it sounds like I didn't really need to write, write my. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> At first, when I was reading that, that that echoed in my head. I was like, oh man, I've heard this before. <laughs> yeah. That was contemporaneous, no less, right? Oh yeah, she just that was off the dome, absolutely. So. <laughs> Um, I always thought Jean Garofalo was very cool. Oh, she was amazing. Yeah, she's great. And now I'm, I think I think doubly. Special. Yeah, right. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, I think she's pretty much. Uh, we're both speaking from the same thing, mm -hmm. um, from the same place. We're co both coming from the same place, and you know, she she does raise the issue about the haves and the have nots. Yeah, right, right. Like I said before, it was something that I didn't really. I don't think I even really wanted to tackle that. Uh, you know, that discussion inevitably will turn into policy discussion, it, and and you'll have to get into research, and you'll have to get into like sociological drift and all mm -hmm. sorts of concepts that I, I'm not familiar with, and that I'm not really an authority. Um, you know, that I don't I don't really have any business talking about all that stuff. Um, you know, I'm a socialist at heart. You could say mm -hmm. I feel in. I, I firmly believe in you know, redistributing wealth. I don't believe that. Um, I believe the rich should be taxed out of the wazoo. I don't mm -hmm. agree with a lot of laissez-faire um, economics at all. I don't believe in free, the free, free market, at least as it's understood um, right now. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, like I am kind of concerned about um, people that are kicked out of their neighborhoods, let's say, because of rising rents. Um, I see it in, in my neighborhood, which is not really necessarily a gentrified neighborhood, but, you know, the supermarket down the block recently had a facelift, and I can only imagine that the product, that the food in there is now, the groceries have become much more expensive, and that a lot of people can't afford them anymore. I can uh -huh. only imagine, I can, I, you know, I have to look at it from their perspective. They used to go in there and spend a certain amount of, month of their paycheck on avocados, now they can't do that. Maybe they are going to need to go to the, uh, you know, kind of less attractive supermarket down the block. And mm -hmm. to, to, you know, I don't know. I'm not. I I am fortunate, and I don't. I can enjoy the the new supermarket with the facelift and say, ah, great, ah, it's so nice in here, aesthetically pleasing. Oh my God, everything's laid out so well, so organized. Ooh, look at the vegetables; they're so fresh. I'm not the person that can't afford those groceries mm -hmm. any longer. So, you know, it's very convenient for me to enjoy the facelift, right? Mm -hmm. If I were that other person. So wh where's that other person going to go? I, I don't know. And I think Janine raises a really good mm -hmm. point about how that is a separate issue and it needs addressing. I mean, th that is an example of just a lot of other shit that's kind of – that's going on um, – in the world, mm -hmm. in the country. Right. And again, I'm not an authority on this, so I'm not really, um, I'm not, uh, you know, disposed or I have no mm -hmm. really, you know, going more in depth um, into this. I'm sorry that I'm rambling a little bit. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> I hope that they're not that too intrusive. No, 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 it's not bad at all. Well, but like with, um, you know, with marginalized communities like, you know, like, like gay people, you know, the reason that we have gay neighborhoods in some of the sketchier parts of towns is because if you get kicked out of your, you know, family's house for being gay, you know, when you're a kid, where are you going to go? You're not going to go to the nice part of town. You're going to make your community where you can afford it. And if you can only afford it in the, you know, no sketchier areas that's where it's going to be but then once you get established and you have an infrastructure and then you know these people start coming in you start getting pushed out and now it's like man i can't even have this place you know so it's awful and i mean that you raise a very good point so mm -hmm. the thing is here's the thing though because we do live in a capitalist society nobody can regulate those neighborhoods it's where business wants to go so mm -hmm. one says oh it's so cool to live here because Richard Hell lived here, <laughs> then I'm gonna go live there, and then ten years later, that one person has turned into like 100 people. They started another like artistic movement, and then so on, and then exponentially it grows until you've got a Chipotle down the block, <laughs> and and that's just what it's kind of like a natural thing that just happens in a capitalist 
that's the way real estate kind of functions mm-hmm. in a capitalist society. So there's very little that any one person can do outside of like boycotting new places. And that, I don't think that that's really, that's not going to happen. Your landlord's going to going to raise your rent no matter what. Oh, yeah. There's really nothing that you can do about it. Uh-huh. The thing is, is, like, I think for me, because, you know, she was writing, I mean, Janine, which she wasn't even writing, she was just talking about mm-hmm. a time, I think she's a little older than I am, so she, mm-hmm. she was probably there before I was. Right, well, she was talking about, like, the early to mid-70s, I think, was what yeah, she was speaking I about. I mean, I, I was born in 74, so, and I grew up mm-hmm. in Queens, so I, I didn't really visit, I didn't know the East Village then. Mm-hmm. Um, my earliest recollection, as I write in the piece, is in 88. Mm-hmm. So it was still, you could say, you know, kind of kind of a, you know, it, it had that kind of downtown 81 kind of mm-hmm. feel to it. But by the time I was a grown adult and I was like successful in music and sort of somewhat of a fixture in that neighborhood, gentrification was already well underway mm-hmm. at that point. The thing is, is, I didn't really know it and I didn't really want to believe it because I wanted to believe the narrative that I was um, going under at that time which mm-hmm. is, I was telling myself at that time which is this is such a cool neighborhood and it's just got some shitty ass people on Fridays and Saturday nights and I wish that they would stay in Long Island and New Jersey <laughs> and up for the cool people that live here right now and like me <laughs> and I just didn't realize just the fact that like I, you know if I'm really honest with myself I don't know that I would have been able to survive in the East Village that Janine Groff was mm-hmm. about, right. read about. You know, so this kind of um, halcyon days, of, mm-hmm. you know, the downtown or the uh, um, the romanticization of it, it it's just, it's, there came a point in time, and it's part of kind of growing up where you just like, okay, so I've got these stories that are handed down, this folklore about what is cool and what's not cool, and I can... I can kind of see that actually I'm a bit hypocritical because while I was busy, be, quote unquote, being cool, this neighborhood, which is now so uncool, was actually permitting me to have that narrative. Mm-hmm. So the, those two realities don't line up. The only realities that could possibly line up is someone like Richard Hell, who did live, or Janine Garofalo, who definitely did live mm-hmm. when shit was crazy. And they, I'm, I doubt that Richard Hell would disagree with her. Uh, mm, right, exactly. <laughs> Even Richard Hell would probably... <laughs> oh, this is better. Right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so I know you got to go. Uh, you you have uh, other errands to run, I'm sure. But um, oh, you better believe. <laughs> I got to get to the post office, sir. Post office. <laughs> I have to return some videotapes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um you're gonna i'm really excited because you're gonna read uh your essay and you're gonna send me the file and we're, and we're gonna um put it at the end here downtown and gentrification dystopia or enlightened future by carlos dangler it all started with a middle finger protruding out of a cupped forearm draped in the calfskin leather of a biker jacket. Pointy, stitched-on studs formed a bed of nails around the jacket's lapels. He was a punk rocker, and he didn't even look at me, marching, almost stomping by me in the blink of an eye as I sat in front of St. Mark's Sounds one humid August day in 1988. I managed to make out his crew cut and earrings before he vanished into clattering street traffic. My feelings would have been hurt had this finger belonged to one of my two friends who were with me on this, my virgin trip into the East Village. But, though it was hardly a welcome package, the flip of the bird didn't feel specific to me. No, I just happened to be in its vicinity. So, lucky me, I'd just been treated to a front row seat of that homegrown East Village insanity I'd been warned about. I wrote it off with a chuckle, this non-sequitur finger, as all the more anthropological matter to absorb into my plastic brain. Just another note to take down on the safari. Back then, in the late 80s, a typical afternoon in Queens would have gotten my friends and I together to exchange notes on the last airing of Headbangers Ball. But here in the East Village, the main event unfolded live, in the flesh, a extemporaneous shot in the arm compared with MTV's scripted assembly line of hits. 
St. Mark's in particular felt feral and hot. People watching from the stoop of a record store took on zoological overtones. I catalogued each purple mohawk, each paranoid strut and jerky rhythm, each audacious tattoo, awestruck by the imponderable renegade madness behind each irreducible human on the street. By the time my friends got out from the record store, now leaving for our next adventure in Tonkin Square Park, I felt I'd become a master of characterology. We walked three blocks east, deeper into the hinterland, to where St. Mark's gave way to the park. Little did I know at the time, Tompkins Square Park was a kind of American Christiania, a micro-society whose self-governing ethos, communal and anarchic, provided off-the-grid liberties to those willing to brave the squalor. Once you passed through, new rules applied. After all, this was circa the infamous riots of 1988, when residents, squatters, and homeless clashed with police in an all-night melee over an ill-begotten 1 a.m. curfew for the park. The band Prong was playing in the quote-unquote auditorium. Actually, it was just a shoddy open pavilion in the park's south flank. They hadn't yet achieved their minor celebrity from the 1990 release of Beg to Differ, so I hadn't heard of them. However, my namesake friend Carlos Ramirez, virtually a Rhodes Scholar of heavy metal, had somehow dug up word of this free en plein air concert. Being Queens boys in the days well before the internet, finding a midday concert by a hardcore metal crossover band deep in the nacreous heart of the East Village was, in hindsight, a perhaps stunning feat of encyclopedic research. The day was overcast, and the show, probably not well promoted, was sparsely attended. In fact, the homeless of the park outnumbered Prong's fan base and made somewhat of a show of their majority by dancing around to their set as though it were a Joan Baez concert. The event also attracted wacky local East villagers, aberrant personalities like the guy with the middle finger whose irreducible quirks had found home in this slapdash neighborhood. Throughout the entire show, a Hercule Poirot impersonator sealed his left ear to one of the giant speakers and nodded his head as though listening not to the eardrum-splitting frequencies of a hardcore metal band, but to the blissed-out vibes of Miles Davis's Bitches Brew. You'd be hard-pressed to find this kind of naturally occurring performance art in the Tompkins Square Park of today. You're more likely to find the now familiar sight of fitness junkies in tank tops glued to iPhones, drinking whey protein smoothies after a workout at the Blink Fitness, which opened last year just half a block south on Avenue A. I don't know where Mr. Poirot is, but I'm sure he's no longer suited to this environment. He's most likely living out his last days in far-off Bushwick. Actually, no, they just gentrified as well. Well, wherever he is, I hope you can still bug out to some heavy metal. Naturally, the homeless still trawl garbage cans and push overflowing carts jam-packed with the miscellany of their scavenging hunts, but they no longer have the cultural drop on the incoming tourist the way they did with us 30 years ago, edged out as they are to the sidelines by the consumerist parade, perennial and ubiquitous, that has long stanched hope of anything approaching the priceless spontaneity of what I witnessed at the Prong concert. But before you mistake me for a dyed-in-the-wool hipster, railing like a Marxist barker at every new Starbucks, the injustice, allow me to confess something that defies my revolutionary vanity. I'm actually not so sure gentrification is all that dystopian. Yes, my wrists ache from so much fist-shaking at the annihilating hand of the establishment, which has swept away so much of the old East Village's madcap curios like a slow-motion economical tsunami. I never shirk an opportunity to denounce the greed and commodification of a neighborhood that was once inimitable, 
I mourn the demise of risk and flavor every time a new think coffee pops up over cover of night, as though it were a sprout on a spud, some kind of viral DNA proliferating in vitro from central hubs of corporations. I wax romantic at all these things, and yet I can't help myself when it comes to a sausage, egg, and cheese. So needy am I of artisanal delectation come breakfast time. I'm going to shamelessly plug Murray's Cheese Shop here, if only because it's in the West Village, not the East. Pardon the heresy, but maybe not all of gentrification is so bad at anyone? The demise of accidental performance art notwithstanding? It's true that nothing will ever replace the old East Village's sparkle, but there's uh, actually something rather grand about 21st century gentrification nonetheless. In 1997, now an androgynous 23-year-old goth, I was sauntering with a friend down St. Mark's Place around 11 p.m. when I felt a hard thwack against the side of my head, just outside the sidewalk vendors of cheap sunglasses and ski hats on the corner of 3rd Avenue. We were college seniors from NYU, headed to a nightclub, no longer extant, and we were dressed to the nines, she and I in head-to-toe black lace, corsetry, and enough goth maquillage to write Happy Halloween on a vanilla cake in thick black icing. One doesn't prepare for a thick smack up the side of the face while tra la on St. Mark's Place on a winter Saturday night with coffin purses and fishnet stockings. I mean, why would one? This is St. Mark's Place, after all. The Shangri-La of cultural acceptance, the seat of the Rainbow Coalition, where all flags stand at equal mast and no subgenre is too small or frail to find acceptance. When it came, I heard myself think, wait, that's not supposed to happen. I turned my shocked countenance in the direction of the smack to find a much more masculine person flanked by a gold-earringed female, belly button exposed, wearing five-inch heels, I'll never forget his saurian eyes, tiny onyx marbles full of fear and judgment. And then came the topper, as he called me a motherfucking faggot, with a, yeah, I did that sneer. Shell-shocked and confused, my friend and I continued on. After submitting our ideas at the door of the club, I broke down into tears in the foyer while she stroked my back and skinny puppy pulsed a muted four on the floor just beyond the doors to the basement dance floor. By the end of the night, I'd forgotten about everything. I'd lost myself in the romantic fantasy of Gothdom, sheltered by the dark safety of a low-ceilinged nightclub, clove cigarette smoke mingling with fog machine emissions, the cumulus sapphire clouds backlit by the automatic weaponry of strobe lighting. Yet, later, throughout the intervening years, I'd wondered to myself, how could that have actually happened? Did that actually happen? It seemed like a dream, an improbable trauma, straight out of a Kafka short story. I'd actually been gay-bashed on my way to a goth club in the East Village. The East Village was in transition in 1997. Almost all of the shops that had made it a famous mecca for counterculturalists far and wide still stood. Mondo Kim's, the Continental Bar, CBGB's, Alt Coffee on Avenue A, Trash and Vaudeville on St. Mark's, the mom and pop shops of punk rock, and other bastions of subculture continued to thrive. What had changed was the level of visible desperation on the street. The neighborhood was only recently opening up to the effects of New York City's dramatic mid-90s crime drop, so sex workers and assailants, until then part and parcel of the East Village experience, even in front of the NYU dorms, had to find other neighborhoods in which to get by. With increased safety came the more familiar emblems of gentrification. Real estate development brought soaring rents and yuppier clientele, death knells for the old-school punk rock establishment. One of the first casualties was my beloved St. Mark Sounds, the scene of the middle finger back in 88. Then Alt Coffee, with its threadbare sofas and bric-a-brac wall art, ceded its space to a gift shop specializing in cheesy hipster t-shirts and cheap jewelry. Soon, 
Predicting which places would tumble next to the onrush of commerce and commodification was like betting on horses where all the steeds seemed destined to run their last race. It was only a matter of time, we thought, before CBGB's, that decades-old fortress of punk rock history, would succumb to the influx of exorbitant rents. Sure enough, CB's been gone for several years. Continental Bar finally just closed this past June 30th. I watched all of this unfold from my Avenue D apartment. Just the notion of my living on Avenue D was proof that gentrification was on the up. I lived there for eight years, from 2000 to 2008, with roommates in the beginning. After years of breaking into piggy banks and scraping the bottoms for lunch money, my old band Interpol became prosperous and all of a sudden I could afford to live alone. I tore down some drywall and spread out my legs on my cheesy Barcelona couch. The band was hugely successful, and I basked in the street cred I gained. I enjoyed a kind of downtown notoriety I could never have anticipated as the naive, befingered 14-year-old sitting on a St. Mark's Place stoop. I was famous and hip, often visible at Max Fish and Lit Lounge. Naturally, both are gone. At age 14... Tompkins Square Park seemed like the last stop before the end of the world. Yet here I was, a decade and a half later, several blocks east, almost hugging the river. I was entrenched, the tantalizing promise of the East Village, a life of rakish infamy at my grasp. I considered myself a true bohemian. But the bohemian narrative needed tweaking, as the old East Village went on dying. So I, I fudged together a grandiose tale of survival. I was the last of the Mohicans, I told myself, aha, uh -huh. citing the opening on Avenue A of the Gourmet Delicatessen Gracefully in 1999 as proof that our values were under attack by capitalism. I, descendant of Richard Hell, was to hold a valiant last stand before the neighborhood surrendered its anarcho-populism to commercial hegemony. Then, having decided my time was up, I would flee to the Upper East Side. I did just that. Now the token artist, moonlighting as an ironic has-been, raconteur to starchy lawyers and doctors. I would tell myself and everyone else that I'd been part of something real, something raw, something so unlike the preppy invasion, something no algorithm could ever ever predict something unannounced. Now for a moment, let's, let's put aside that I was no bohemian, but actually a rich rock star with skyrocketing paychecks, a one percenter disguised as a revolutionary. I made the most of my East Village residency. I milked my tenure there for all the bohemian lore it could give. But in a very real sense, I was no different than most of the incoming wealth, the Abercrombie invasion, as it were cocaine and late-night DJ sets be damned. I simply disguised myself. Although, if you were to look closely at the costume and notice the bespoke tailoring, one might say I didn't do the best job of mimicking a starving artist. What I hate admitting more than that, though, is that for all its corporate fakery, gentrification was critical to my East Village residency, most importantly because it provided an umbrella of physical safety under which I could feel free to carouse. I do have to wonder how I would have fared in the East Village of the 80s, with its unenforced building codes and the plywood that had to be nailed to the windows against marauders, everywhere a bombed-out Berlin hosting drugs and danger. How could I have gotten away with the late-night DJ sets my social bread and butter, what with all the unwilling cab drivers, rightfully wary as they were, of driving into Alphabet City at night? Do we want to go back to the old East Village anyway? To a time when the price of having access to so much on-the-street spontaneity, to so many authentic curatorial vendors, and to affordable rent in downtown Manhattan was simply an occasional assault on the street for being a man who wears makeup? I'm not so sure. It would be one thing if the gentrifiers came in, 
decimated the countercultural landscape as they have, set up their Disneyland of artisanal bakeries and smoothie shops, and replaced the old guard with an air of intolerance. But I don't find that to be the case. If anything, I sense so much tolerance on the street these days, at least in the realm of LGBTQIA issues, that I find it hard to believe that that slap I endured in 1997 could today go unchecked, as it did back then. For every same-sex couple I see holding hands on the street today, no longer an act of bravery, no longer some daring lifestyle statement, but simply the natural and public expression of affection between two people who love each other, I breathe a sigh of gratitude for the age of tolerance that, when it comes to the cities, I am free to enjoy. We have hashtag revolutions like hashtag BLM and hashtag Me Too to thank for this lifting of consciousness, this awakening. Not to mention SJWs like Sean King who marshal crackdowns on hate crimes simply by distributing photos and videos to his large Twitter following. All across the media spectrum, from music videos like Peach's Rub, which depicts a procession of queer bodies celebrating all forms as beautiful, to ad campaigns like that of the aforementioned Blink Fitness, that great bellwether of gentrification, which display pan-anatomy in order to encourage all to come and get fit, regardless of size, complexion, or creed, we're witnessing consciousness raising at a rate not seen since the civil rights movement. Public health, too, has seen gains, as myths about artistic romantic ideals tied to vice get shattered. A uh, Jackson Pollock cigarette, anyone? Try looking at the Marlboro Man with a straight face, post-Bloomberg, after his smoking ban of 2003 in New York, once the bane of my existence, transformed our workspaces from holdovers of the Koch era to more dignified environs of the 21st century. I throw the notion of smoking indoors into the Stone Age cart of ideas, along with drinking three martinis at lunch and living with asbestos. It sounds trite, but there's a simple way to look at gentrification. Things change. People and ideas evolve. It's no accident that so much of consciousness raising has happened online. The internet is mostly responsible for a lot of those East Village casualties, specifically the record stores and bookstores, as music purchasing and book buying steadily inhabit the virtual realm more and more. If you take America's great age of tolerance and compassion with all its varying levels of wokedom, the link with social media, specifically Twitter and Facebook, is pretty clear. The great good of the compassionate hashtag is difficult to imagine without the internet's reach. Now that very reach is also responsible for opening a new Think Coffee, the predictable commodified version of the anarchic alt coffee, and ditto for other upgrades on the grungier examples of yesteryear. It's only one more step further up to the premium ticket of greater health to get you to spend an extra $3 on a vegan wrap if you are already on board the smoking is bad train. Where consciousness is raised, why not taste? Hence a greater demand for artisanal brews, and with that greater demand, more franchises and chains. Transmission has reached new levels of the gastronomic as well as the social I wonder how many chefs have been born from Pinterest. It was only a matter of time before hipsters and punks got wise to the idea of public health and greater acceptance. It's an inherent occupational hazard of any liberal enclave, and those enclaves were the quintessence of progressivism, that it ignores the zeitgeist at its own peril. To the cold hard facts, the liberal mindset must always defer. Notions associated with greater cultural consciousness, such as systemic racism, informed consent, and the public health gains of the past 20 years, have all been fueled by the Internet's ubiquity. Open as we have always been, we hipsters and punks and other counterculturalists appear all the more unbecoming if we ignore these weather vanes. We all must get jobs to afford this new consciousness, of course, as sustainable growth coffee does not come cheaply, but that's our responsibility. We can't hide in the dark, comforting womb of some neighborhood any longer, under the palliative light of cavalier notions of sticking it to the man, not when the world, 
thanks to the internet, is one giant neighborhood, the proverbial global village. It pains me to say all this. I've long chafed at the incursions of gentrification. Nothing was more heartbreaking than CBGB's closing. I was stupefied by the opening of the Rivington Hotel on Houston, a fucking high-rise in the LES? Come on! I miss walking underneath the old abandoned tracks of the West Side Line in Chelsea, now the lush and Euro-trashy High Line Park. I miss the feeling it gave me, that delicate balance of faint danger and creative stimulus, the, the same feeling which gave birth to inimitable dangerous art like No Wave and Neo-Expressionism. I still watch the Dresden-like rubble littering the streets of the LES and the East Village in the background of Downtown 81 and get a buzz contemplating how irreducible that art was, how spontaneous, how utterly unrepeatable, how it was so unlike commodification, that, that tacky virtuoso of repetition. I look past the awkward acting of Jean-Michel Basquiat as he cringingly plays out a half-baked fantasy of Pied Piperism and instead take in Fab Five Freddy, pre-Yo MTV raps, amidst an impromptu daytime DJ set somewhere deep in a squat. I scream at the screen, if only that were today! But this is just me grieving. Five stages of the Kubler-Ross model will come to an end eventually. I can speed that process along by reminding myself that there's more to the image of vital art in the 80s than is revealed simply by watching Downtown 81. I only need to go back to another film from the 80s, Sixteen Candles, and remember the gong sound that accompanies Long Duck Dong whenever he enters the frame. The nauseous feeling I get when I think of how relatively recent this offensive caricature is goes a long way in dispelling those sentimental vapors of romance for bygone times. Behind every nostalgia, there is some great hostility being perpetrated. Yes, POTUS is evil. But I take great comfort in living in a world where such overt shows of racism would never pass muster. Having to admit that things have changed puts a damper on my artistic vanity, my doctored self-portrait of a bohemian living in creative extremis. But it builds character. And this is never more the case than when I take in the social advances of this second decade of the 21st century. My standards are higher today, and that goes for my social attitudes as well as for my coffee. Besides, railing against corporate America's reach as I sit here writing this essay with a venti blonde roast drip from Starbucks by my side strikes me as a bit hypocritical.